Hi there, an unexpected and a brief uh, episode of um, IndyCar today. Sorry, there hasn't been any warning from me about when I was going to broadcast today, but I hope uh, some of you will be able to see this broadcast. Anyway, I thought I would bring you bang up to date with a few things. Now, it's been a, a busy week, obviously, in politics with the whole Gary Lineker thing. Uh, all over the front pages of the newspapers and on every single domestic uh, United Kingdom television channel. But one thing that the Gary Lineker episode has proved beyond all doubt is that when a government attempts to muzzle free speech, particularly the free speech of somebody who's on their own social media account, who's not working for the BBC at the time, when somebody tries to stop that person from basically expressing their own opinion in this way, then many thousands of other people will come to their support. Now we know that Gary Lineker is not presenting much of the day and other <coughs> football programmes have had to be cancelled as well because so many other presenters, football pundits and even football teams and even the English rugby team I believe have refused uh, to, to actually take to the field <coughs> today in support of Mr Lineker. Now that is good news in many ways because it shows that when people get out there and actually take action, the government has to stop doing what it's doing and look again at the whole situation. Now, one of the things that uh, this proves is that freedom of speech is not something which can be taken away from an individual by a government such as the far-right Tories, even though they have a placeman who is in charge of the BBC. Um, that placeman is not able to make a case uh, against Mr Lineker because Mr Lineker's comments were not made on live television. He was not working for the BBC when he expressed his opinions. And people express their opinions all the time. Whether you believe them or not and whether you agree with them or not, they have a right to actually express their own opinions. That's known as freedom of speech. And it is guaranteed under, again, the United Nations and it is accepted the world over by every free-thinking democracy, except, of course, the Tories. Now, whether you think the, uh, the whole policy of the United Kingdom, uh, as sort of explained by the uh, Home Secretary, uh, Suella Bridgman, was similar to the way uh, that the German government behaved in the 1930s and its attitudes and the way it uh, tried to monster individuals who were in minorities as being the enemy and getting people to focus on that or not, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that Mr Lineker expressed his own individual opinion outside of his employment and that he is perfectly entitled to do. But not only that, other countries have done similar things. Now we've heard this week that the, uh, the United Kingdom's House of Lords and now uh, the United Kingdom's government itself has said publicly, and this is of course the Daily Mail and the Daily Express punting this idea, that um, all Scots foreign envoys who are going on trade missions uh, to other countries should be accompanied by a British diplomat to make sure that they don't talk about independence. Well, how exactly are they going to stop them from doing that, since other countries are quite happy to listen to Scottish uh, politicians or envoys or trade ambassadors talking about independence any time. It's not something which would make any huge difference to the countries involved, and it is freedom of speech. It's freedom of speech being expressed in somebody else's country, and if it doesn't happen on the premises of United, Na uh, United Kingdom's uh, embassy, then there is nothing to stop that conversation happening. This is more desperate attempts by the United Kingdom to try and plug the leaking gap in freedom of speech, which they can't control. So it's not going to work. And any Scottish envoy going to a trade hub anywhere across the world, it doesn't matter where it is, can have meetings with their counterparts in private rooms outside the British Embassy and there's not a thing that the United Kingdom's embassy can do about that because it would be encroaching on their freedom of speech. So that is not going to happen and it, as I've said, just illustrates the desperation of the Tory government in realising that the Scots are now going to seek 
the kind of recognition that we need for our stance in using a general election as a plebiscite to allow the Scots to express their actual views of the Union freely. Now, whether you agree or not that a general election is the place to do that doesn't matter. It's the only democratic event that's been allowed to remain open to us, and it's something which no other country in the rest of the developed world would not recognise. So that's not going to fly either. So we will get the recognition we need, and foreign countries will listen to Scottish diplomats and uh, trade ministers if they're talking about independence and seeking reassurances from those countries that they would recognise a Scottish vote uh, in favour of independence in an election plebiscite since it's the only way we are allowed to vote. Anyway, to move on from that and to the leadership campaign, well it's beginning to look very much like Kate Forbes is going to win this, a few believe polls that is. Hamza Youssef, despite being heavily pushed by what I would call the SNP's old guards, such as John Swinney and some of the other senior members of the SNP's if you like, former government or former ministerial group, I think shows you there's a divide here between what was the uh, Nicola Sturgeon administration and Kate Forbes' supporters out with that group. Now what's happened to Ash Regan is anybody's guess, but if Hamza Yusuf's uh, approval rating has dropped, and if you look at the actual voting numbers for both Hamza Yusuf and Ash Regan, if those who have currently been uh, supporting uh, Hamza Yusuf realise he's on a hiding to nothing and switch their votes to Ash Regan, then Ash Regan would actually beat Kate Forbes because the combined might of those two uh, percentages of the vote would actually exceed those for Kate Forbes. Will that happen? Well, it's possible, isn't it? Anything's possible. Who knows what will happen? But are we going to the vote this week anyway? But whatever happens, we need to have a look at what happens after that. Somebody has published an interesting article recently and sent it to me on the way in which Norway separated itself from the Kingdom of Sweden. After a brief war, Norway was kind of taken over by Sweden, and the Swedes gave them what we have, basically, which is a domestic uh, parliament with domestic control over domestic policies. Um, but that wasn't enough for the Norwegians, and they began to think that they really wanted their independence back. And so they elected a government which said that it would declare independence if it was elected. And it was elected. At this point, the king, uh, I think it was the king of Sweden, and I can't remember all the details here, might have been the king of Norway even, objected to this and said that we couldn't possibly separate themselves from Sweden in this way, and he was going to put a stop to it. So they all promptly resigned and asked the current king if he would like to uh, create a new government, to form a new government for Norway, which of course he couldn't do, because A is not a politician, he was supposedly a constitutional monarch. And so that government fell, and that meant that all of the current government of Norway then resigned en masse, uh, and eventually held a referendum, because under their constitution, if no government could be formed, there had to be a referendum to decide the matter. It was decided, and it was a huge majority in favour of leaving the Kingdom of Sweden and separating themselves from that, and they successfully declared their independence. It's not dissimilar to the situation that we find ourselves in, with a head of state who's largely been imposed upon us by our next-door neighbours, and uh, bearing in mind that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government have the ability, if you have a majority in the House of Holyrood, to change the standing orders so that the Parliament of Holyrood can also decide whenever it wants to have a general election and that's not something that can be stopped by the UK. The only way that the United Kingdom could stop that would be to completely abolish the entire Holyrood Parliament and that would be extraordinarily difficult for them to do and almost impossible for them to justify in any meaningful way. So it is entirely possible that whoever wins this contest, whether it is Kate or Ash Regan, I don't think it's going to be Hamza somehow looking at the polls, but whoever it is, if they decided to do so, they could force a Holyrood election and use that as the means of gaining our independence. And as I've already said, since people can't be stopped from talking privately on foreign trips, there's no way the United Kingdom could prevent Scottish envoys from having 
uh, private meetings with their counterparts, the foreign secretaries of these other countries, seeking their support for Scotland's voting in this way, and also seeking recognition for the results should we win it. So I don't think uh, the British state has got any real ammunition left to fight this battle, and it looks to me like whoever ends up becoming the, um, the new First Minister of Scotland needs to take a bit of action because, I mean, Kate Forbes is actually saying now that there hasn't been any foundation work done on independence for quite some considerable time. And this is something which we all suspected, but nobody's ever actually heard it articulated before, specifically not from a former Scottish minister. So it's interesting that Kate Forbes has chosen now to point out what we've all known for many years, which is that there haven't been any fundamental underpinnings of independence created, something which Ash Regan and Kate Forbes probably would agree on, if nothing else. So let's wait and see what happens in the, the next uh, few days. The election of whoever is the leader of the SNP and likely to become the First Minister will be settled in the next few days, and we should find out fairly soon who that's going to be. It would be fascinating, actually, if Ash Regan was incorporated into the new administration, since she seems to have the, uh, the best ideas at the moment for a more direct route uh, to a, dem a democratic decision on independence than the other two candidates. But then Kate Forbes has not fully disclosed what she plans to do. And let's face it, Nicola Sturgeon did not give any of the three candidates enough time to actually build a proper campaign uh, and a platform on which to be elected. It was all done on the hurry up. It was all so unexpected. So whoever it is, is going to be the person who was fastest thinking on their feet and came up with a cogent plan which could be achieved uh, and which was possible, especially given international law, something which is very important when you're leaving a larger body like the United Kingdom and becoming or returning to the state of independence. So anyway, that's about it from me today. But just bear in mind, the United Kingdom is not able to silence the Scottish people when they are abroad talking to um, trade envoys and foreign ministers about getting recognition for a Scottish vote on independence. The British state is just desperate now to try and plug the leaks uh, in free speech. And they've been trying to do that, first of all, by, <laughs> I guess, uh, monstering basically the highest paid television presenter in the BBC who expressed an opinion, not publicly, not during the broadcast, but his own private time when he was a private individual. And he has manifestly succeeded in defending himself. The BBC is now going to be forced into the humiliation of a U-turn and trying to entice um, <laughs> trying to entice Gary Lineker back onto their screens. Will they apologise? Well, who knows? But it's interesting, and it just goes to show you that you can't keep a good man down, and you certainly can't extinguish a legitimate cause like independence by simply getting some ambassadors to look over the shoulder of a Scots politician while he's chatting to somebody else. It's not going to happen. Anyway, that's it from me today. Sorry it was such a rush program. Uh, I'm off to do a couple more lessons before I go home. But anyway, keep the faith and remember that whoever becomes the leader of the SNP has got to come up with a spectacularly good plan. And let's see what happens between Ash Regan and Kate Forbes because really I think Hamza is, although he's being pushed and he seems to be getting most of the, uh, the money spent on his campaign and getting the support of people like John Swinney and other senior members of the SNP group in Holyrood, I don't think he's going to make it. I somehow think that it will be Kate Forbes. Maybe Ash Regan has a chance. We don't know until the votes come in. But whoever you choose, let's just have a think about asking this new leader what the real route to independence is going to be and what underpinnings and foundations that person is going to put in place in the first 100 days of their leadership because that is what's most important to all of us. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.